So we are here in Purcell, Oklahoma, on our way over to Oklahoma City to watch a girlfriend do some showing at the AQHA World Show. And this is true. <laughs> this is true. And you already know Wileen Wilson, but my name's Sarah and I'm hanging out with her today and <laughs> picking her brain. And as an aspiring cult starter, I have some questions for her because I'd like to do maybe some cult starting challenges in the next year or so. That's cool. I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. Thinking about it. Nice. Oh, so. I got some advice. <laughs> I got some tips of the trade. So I've, I've seen you work with already kind of like halter bro courses. <clears throat> what would your advice be if you were in a setting where, I mean, they're just like wild? Uh, I've had that actually several times. And so... It depends on your location, obviously. Like, if you have, a like, an arena or a facility where you can get them into a smaller area, preferably, in all honesty, even with working wild horses, I love a 24 by 24 pin. If you can get something like that with high walls or high, high fencing, that's preferable. Uh, if you have a really nice round pin, use that. Obviously, you want to put yourself in a safe environment and a safe position to do so. So... I would say start there. Make sure you have something you can, like, get them to. So, even if they're, like, in a trailer, and you bring them and you back the trailer up and unload them, mm -hmm. you know, you can start there. Then from there, uh, depending on the horse, some horses you might have to rope them to catch them. Other horses you can approach them and then retreat, approach them and mm -hmm. see if they'll, like, let you get close to them or touch them with a stick or touch them with a whip so that they know that you're not going to hurt them. Uh, and then you can, and I, this is just my thing, just when I've worked a lot of wild horses, uh, I never want to approach them from the front. I always mm -hmm. approach them at like the shoulder, like near their, like between their throat latch and their shoulder because they can see you out of their eye. And so that's normally where I start, like with that. And then if I can touch them, I can normally catch them. Mm -hmm. And even if it's, even if it's just... Touching them and walking away, touching them and walking them away, making them curious about me, wanting them to kind of drawing them into me. That's exactly what I want to do. So sometimes it's not about catching them; it's about mm -hmm. them catching you. Okay. What uh, what percentage of the time would you say you've had to like rope one instead of doing the advanced nursery? Super rare. Super Rarely. Rare. Now here's the thing, though. I will just claim this: that like in the Mustang, in the Mustang world, and like preparing for a makeover, when the horses are at the BLM going through the squeeze shoot, I have a halter on. So that I don't have to fight with that and worry about it. If I have a lead rope on them, I can just get a hold of them. Mm -hmm. uh, but I did have a Mustang mare one time that didn't have a halter on her. And I just created a squeeze chute so I could like run her up in there so I could pet her and then put the halter on myself. Mm -hmm. uh, some people want to do a lot of groundwork and liberty training to like create that relationship and bond with them. There's nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. You can do it. There's several different approaches to it. But for me personally, I would much rather just already have the halter on them or if they come and they're not halter broke then I'd put them in a pin where I'm not too too far away not like a 60 foot round pin where I'm just chasing them all day long but close enough that I can get my hands on them and if I can't get my hands on them then I'll probably rope them okay and you learn to have skills eventually <laughs> you figure it out I bet yeah yeah I, I can see where that would go wrong if maybe you miss or something and you end up just defending the horse oh yeah yeah well not just that kind of starting cause... over yeah and you can cause a wreck you know you can cause a problem if you're not in the right place at the right time. Mm -hmm. I bet. So when you're doing, you start colts for a living, or you, you do many things for a living, colt starting being one of them. Um, how would you say it differs, like, your day-to-day -day work versus, say, you're in a competition, like, if they put, like, restrictions on your typical methods? That's a good question. How do you, how do you kind well, of work around that? Right, because at Road to the Horse, there's several rules. What I mean by that is, like, there's you can't restrain your horse, you can't hobble your horse, you can't lay your horse down, you can't wear spurs. Those are all things I do to colts. <laughs> I wear spurs, I lay them all down, I hobble them, I restrain them, I bit them up. So, so my approach is going to be a little different, uh -huh. which I'm fine with. Like, I, I actually like that. It forces me to step outside of my comfort zone. And um, so, having said that, I kind of feel like there's a there's a time and a place that you can implement things that is like mandatory every time. But in a in a cold starting setting where it's a competition, you might have to actually change what you do and how you do it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. 
but like if I was at home, I like to just get in and get the job done. And I don't make excuses. And I don't, I, here's the other thing I've learned with Colts, in, in all honesty, that first time that you spend that day with them or that first ride with them, that's the most important day. Because you're establishing the trust and the respect with the horse. How I gain that is through the lay down. So some people gain that through groundwork, I don't. I do it a little bit differently, that's just my thing. So I feel more comfortable, I just feel more comfortable being with the horse on the ground once I've worked with the lay down and teaching the lay down. Mm -hmm. Cause then it's kind of a lie detector. But if I if I wasn't able to do that in a, in like a setting where it was a competition, then I would still go in and establish a relationship of trust and understanding that the horse looks to me for the leadership. So for the road to the horse, since they have restrictions kind of against what you, like you explained, you typically do, do you kind of already have like a mental like map of what you want the session to look like? Yeah. You know, and I heard somebody say this not too long ago and it just really resonated with me personally. And I, this was not a horse person, but it applied to my life in so many areas, which was, he said, you know, you, you don't plan, you prepare. And if you're prepared, uh, then you're ready to execute any situation. And I, I kind of attribute that to, it's almost like being a doctor, you know, you're just ready to operate anything that shows up on the table. You can handle the situation and you don't have a panic moment. So I really want to be prepared. So what I mean by that is just like the right equipment, the right timing and the right knowledge to read the animal and say, Oh, I need to change what I'm doing. This mm -hmm. isn't working. The horse is talking to me. So those are things that I really pay attention to. That the level of language with the horse and like the way the horse's energy is, that's really vital to me. And it's something that I'm really um, I'm really keen on. Mm -hmm. Really, really pay attention to the horse's body language. So that's cool. I'll approach it however I need to. So it sounds like you have like a plan A, B, C, D, and all the way to X if, yeah, if need much. be. And then you know, honestly, my thing is establish some rules and like a relationship on the ground, some boundaries and some kind of hi, welcome to earth, I'm your leader type of thing. And then from there, it's just getting on them. Yeah. It's time to ride them because in that particular competition, you got to go through this pretty wicked, you know, obstacle course that most domestic horses wouldn't even dare to go through. Yeah. So it's a lot of preparation and a lot of, uh, it's a lot of time that you have to, those first two days are your time to establish that with that horse because day three, you have to be able to showcase what you, mm -hmm. you basically laid the foundation of. And you know what's weird? I gotta be honest, like, I thrive in those moments. Mm -hmm. I, I love a competition. I love having pressure. I love being able to say, I can do that. I'm gonna try this. And I, I think the challenge of putting myself out there and teaching the basic handle, which is my thing, and some of the other approaches I have will be so cool to do in a, in a big setting like that. So it's a huge honor. Yeah, that'll be so exciting to watch. Yeah, yeah. I'm super excited about it. So just getting myself prepared, you know, because it's not so much that I, want, I don't want to let people down. It's that it's my job to deliver. That's what mm -hmm. people are there to see. They want to see my method, my approach, how I would handle the situation, what I would do. And it's also about educating. It's about entertaining. And it's about executing and getting the job done. And you know, it's about inspiring others, obviously like someone like yourself, you know, there's a lot of young women that probably look up to me and go, I want to do what she does, but there's really nobody out there that they can look to that's an, a female cult starter. Yeah. You just don't hear of that very often. We're, we're kind of rare and few and far between. And so I think I'm almost representing women as a whole and, and that it's possible and that you can do anything as long as you have kind of the guts and the grit to do it and also you will work hard and pay attention and do whatever it takes to get that exposure to as many horses as possible so like it's kind of cool that I get to be kind of the pioneer behind that because truly cold starting is one of my all-time favorite things to do because horses have just taught me like so much and, uh, and I've grown and changed a lot like anybody who's known me for more than 10 years can tell you like I think I used to come from a really a really big place of like um, I used to just not have any like remorse or regret for things that like I would do I didn't care I just would get in and like do it and now I, I kind of will take a step back and go what does this horse need in particular so I'm a little softer in my approach and I'm a little bit more aware of that it's not about me mm -hmm. it's definitely about the horse and um, and that took time to, to learn that because when I was a kid I was so fearless um, but I was also chaotic and sloppy. I didn't care. I just get on and get the job done. But now I go, I want to be 
it calculated. And I want to be prepared so that there's no, there's no, there's nothing lost in translation where the horse understands. It. So I've just grown and changed a lot, and I'm and I'm glad, and I'm glad to even say that on an interview. You know, like we all grow, we all evolve, we all change, and we all bring things to our lives that hopefully help us to be better and to really like empower ourselves. And that's kind of where I'm at right now. And I'm 40 years old now. Like when I was in my 20s. I just climb on anything, but I was a little tough, a little mm-hmm. tough on horses, and and um, not so apologetic. And now I'm a little more apologetic, and I'm a little more understanding, a little more forgiving. And um, so I hope I can transmit that through the crowd and through the horse. Yeah, yeah, that that'll be such a great process to watch and <clears throat> super inspiring, I think. Oh, thank you. Yeah, no. I'm totally so looking forward to it. when you're talking about you know your your various plans and kind of backup plans and all that, and how you're gonna try to fit the horse a little better than a one-size-fits-all what kind of gear equipment are you going to have ready for that so yeah it's nothing like anything special or different from anyone else honestly it's you know I'll have a ring rope and a couple long lines in case I need to like if I have a horse it's a nasty kicker where I'm not in the horse's space Uh, obviously I ride in a balance ride which is like a Monte Foreman balance ride when I ride Colts that's my go-to saddle that I use uh, it helps me to kind of be in the proper position. So, like, when things get kind of wonky and get out of position and horse gets waspy, I'm, like, right in the middle of one. It's really hard for them to unseat me. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, and so I'll have that. And then I'll – my goal is obviously to ride my horse in a snaffle. There's several people who don't ride in snaffles the first ride. They ride in a halter or, like, a bozelle or, like, a loping hackamore or something like that. That's not really my strength. Um, if I had to do that, I would. Uh, it kind of terrifies me. <laughs> I just, I've ridden enough bad horses to know that I kind of want to be able to get a hold of them if I need to. So I'll prepare the horse, and if I can make it happen and be in the snaffle, I think, you know, that's kind of where I go. But other than that, nothing besides a, a flag. I'll probably have an oversized ball. You know, another thing I do with my colts, and I'll probably do it while I'm there, is I'll jump the horse, like, over barrels. Oh, fun. To free their body up, because guess what you have to do in an obstacle course? You have to jump. And nobody really jumps the horse. They'll do like the step overs. But I want to be able to jump my horse where it looks like the horse is like not thinking about the jump and just thinking about going forward. So I've been thinking a lot about that because after watching Road to the Horse for years, you know, I want a horse that's willing to just like like attack the course and like get it done. Yeah. Because that's how I am. I'm kind of a doer. So I want my horse to be a doer. Like, oh, sure, we're going to do this. Sure. Like, let's do that. That's an adventure. That'll be fun. So it's to have that relationship with that horse. That's cool. Yeah. You guys will feed off each other. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So what else are, like, what kind of things are you doing to, like, mentally prepare? That's a good question. Uh, I think a lot of it's, too, just, like, reflection upon myself, who I am as a human and who who I am as a woman and as a horseman. And so there's that aspect of it, you know. And then the mental side of it is just preparation and being prepared for competition legit competition and I'm the only female so uh not that that matters but you know that's a huge honor it it is and just I think the world we live in not to get too political but I I feel like you'll be judged sure or people are going to be watching you they're going to be curious I get stereotyped all the time uh so I love to be able to weight on the shoulders yeah I love to like prove people wrong and go I'm different let me show you why yeah and if they're willing to watch for just long enough they might see something they might like so Um, and so, and then as far as just in general, like as far as other things, you know, I mean, every single day I write down something that I want to accomplish within the competition, my goals, my intentions, what I'm setting out to do. And it's very calculated, very clear about what I want. So, so I'm going there with very, very clear intentions, not just that, but I'm going there to change lives my horse's life, people's life in the audience, that's what I'm there to do, is to inspire and to basically be innovative because nobody's seen my program and the way I start a cult, and I think it's the fastest, easiest way. I think it's just like a no-nonsense, um, I don't I don't get too many frills, and I don't get into like, oh, I want to love my horse to death. I want to give my horse a job mm-hmm. and allow it to realize where it belongs so it can be happy because they're looking for boundaries they love rules they're like children they just need they need guidance but they also need leadership so that's where I come in 
That's so just nice. a lot of mental preparation. And then about two months before, I'll start getting in physical shape. <laughs> Gosh. Oh, shoot. I better run on the treadmill. I'm super out of shape. Like, I could ride a horse all day, but I can't run from here to the mailbox without being winded. So I'll probably, you know, get a little more fit, eat a little bit better, be prepared physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, just be ready. That's good. So when you're in the pen with the horse and you're talking about establishing leadership, what, what are some of the first kind of exercises you do or? Well, you know, like all the powers in the horse's feet. And so I want to control those feet. I don't necessarily want to control the horse's head. And I think out there in the world of cold starting, a lot of people like really over, over, um, disengage the hip. Uh, that's become really popular. The problem is they don't work on the front feet either. They just focus on the hind feet moving right and left. So I spend a lot of time, one of the first things I like to establish is the halter, what it means, and backing the horse up. And then can I turn right? Can I turn left? Can I move their shoulders right and left? And so it's not just disengaging the hip. It's more than that. So my, my approach is a little bit different. Uh, and it depends on the horse. Like, I'm looking for softness. That, like, when I ask the horse, will yield to pressure? That's when you've got a good student on your hands. When one will yield and be soft to pressure. So cool. That's a lot of good advice and stuff to think about. And I'll have to think about some more questions. Okay, cool. All right, thanks. Okay, you're welcome.